Yeah, this is more my size now. I ate a blooming onion this afternoon, so I can see why you're back farther. Tonight, tonight you have a good reason. Uh, before we begin, um, I need to, which I should have done this morning, again, forgive me. Uh, let me introduce my wife formally to you, if you'll stand up. This is my wife, Oriana, or if you speak Spanish, it's Oriana, and then Victoria is my oldest daughter, and Sophia is down on the other end of the pew there next to Kelly Armstrong. So this is uh, my family, and we'll be adding a son here in July, and we're not sure what we're going to name him yet, so <laughs> trying, to, trying to get that figured out, but they, um, they bring me a lot of, of joy and happiness and, and rebuke me at the same time, and those of you who have kids know what I'm talking about, so thank you guys. Um, I also was asked to say a little bit more about who, uh, who we are and where we've been. Uh, my wife and I, this is our 13th year, we're going on our 13th year of marriage, and um, we, uh, I went to Bob Jones University, we actually met there. She actually got saved her freshman year, got saved out of Catholicism, uh, grew up in the Dominican Republic, and as you know, in a lot of Latin American countries, you're born into Romanism. And it's not a, a choice, you are just a Catholic. So um, that has been a little difficult for her family to accept. They are still unsaved. Um, we have had numerous opportunities to share grace with them. Uh, but we do ask, as you think of us, to pray for them. Um, I grew up in a pastor's home in West Virginia, so I'm a, I'm a, a hick, and she's a, a Hispanic, so we have uh, Hispanic children. <laughs> And uh, that's uh, poor things. <laughs> but yes, we, uh, I have very fond memories of West Virginia. The West Virginia people are some of the dearest people you'll ever meet, for those of you who know. And others of you who've been to Tennessee and other places can, can uh, vouch for the, the country folk, as they're called. Um, we, uh, as I said, we met at Bob Jones University. And... Um, uh, my wife studied art for several years and then ended up switching over to humanities and uh, obtained a degree there. We also, right after we got married, uh, before we got married, I was in Hawaii as a uh, youth pastor and a school administrator. We had about 1,200 students in our Christian school there. And uh, obviously since the collapse in recent time, th those numbers have gone down. Uh, and then we took a position at uh, Westwood Christian School and First Baptist Church of Westwood Lake where we met the Armstrongs uh, down in Miami. And at that time when we got there, there were about 1,100 uh, students there. And again, same, same thing. A lot of Christian schools are getting hit, aren't they? Um, so it's been an interesting ride. And then from there, I moved to Greenville. I was asked to uh, uh, teach at Bob Jones University in the counseling department. And then uh, the crisis hit. And so we, they asked us to wait. And in the meantime, we... Um, got our license in real estate and, and construction and started doing that and flipping houses and all that fun stuff. And then uh, Bob Jones came back and ended up asking me to change my major to um, experimental psychology, which I was done with my classwork and starting my dissertation. So I didn't really, wasn't fond of starting over in my doctor degree. So uh, we decided that's not what God had for us. And uh, over the, the course of the next couple of years, we prepared to move to the Dominican Republic. And uh, we're, God really blessed us in the, the house flipping. It was before it became a trend and all that fun stuff. But we had a blast doing it and um, ended up moving to the Dominican Republic about three years ago and uh, helped with a church plant there. They just got, uh, right before we left, they, uh, we broke ground for the building and... Um, uh, ended up moving back. It actually wasn't our, even our plan to move back. Um, it was all in God's providence that, that he guided us through uh, various circumstances and various counsel. Um, and so we're here searching for what God has for us. Uh, I, I have written two books. Um, one uh, is on a biblical approach to those who are labeled uh, what the secular world calls ADHD. Um, and without getting into that whole... <laughs> That's a whole <laughs> another spiel. Uh, it took me, I, for 10 years, both being a school administrator and interviewing the leading secularists, the, you know, reading hundreds of books, 
um, I came to the conclusion that uh, what they call an illness is actually just normal, childlike. In some cases, it's physical, but most of the cases, it's just spiritual uh, immaturity that, that we all have. And a lot of people don't realize that in 1902, the first label of ADHD was actually a morbid defect in moral control. Dr. George Still is the first one to say, hey, these behaviors represent a morbid defect in moral control. But over time, as secularists do, the label shifted into a alleged brain condition, which doesn't exist. And I won't go into that, those details, but the, the second book that I wrote was, how do you, so I criticized in the first one, I actually just used their, their writings. And the second one is on Proverbs chapter four, how do you teach a child to pay attention? And amazingly enough, the scripture is very clear on, on both what attention is and how to teach a child to pay attention. In fact, in the first nine chapters of Proverbs, it says 10 times, my son, give me your attention. And so, uh, again, that's a whole other topic. But uh, that, that book has been uh, very meaningful uh, for us. I mean, it, who doesn't need to pay attention better, right? <laughs> Um, and, and really, without going into those details, attention boils down to the treasures of our heart. We will pursue and pay attention to what we value most. So where your treasure is, there is your heart also. So uh, that's the second book. And then the book I'm working on now, which Lord willing will be done uh, by Christmas time, is a big, I've been working on it for, um, seriously, for the last three years. Um, and it's a, a biblical explanation of what secularists call mental illness. So um, ironically, I've been reading a lot of Thomas Saz, who, if you've studied Scientology, uh, helped to found Scientology. And obviously, we don't agree with uh, his views, but he completely undermines and exposes all the logical fallacies that are involved in calling what is spiritual uh, an illness and making it a physical thing. So that's a, um, uh, when I mention that to people, what I'm writing, everybody says, oh, I, I wanna read that one. You know, it's, it's a big topic in our, in our country and um, it, it's completely uh, a, a secularist attempt to explain that which scripture explains. Of course, if you don't hold to the gospel and hold to God, you have to explain it somehow. So uh, that's a little bit about what we're doing now. And um, I'm also, uh, Currently, I'm, I, I shoot a lot of uh, uh, professional real estate photography for realtors, so that provides for my family while I'm finishing this book. And um, I also do a lot of weddings. I shoot a lot of photography weddings. So I enjoy that. I've always enjoyed that all my life. And uh, uh, just we have fun. My wife and I get to do that together and get to hear you know, a lot of good messages about marriage, and, and, and uh, it's fun to do. So, but we, we do feel called to the ministry and are just really, you know, seeing what God has for us as far as what avenue. I'm um, getting really neat opportunities to speak on the first book on, you know, such a need of um, people want to know what, what is this whole uh, idea of ADHD and how do you really help people? Because the secular world said there's no hope, but we know that's not true, don't we? So, anyway, that's a little bit about who we are and... Uh, Maybe that was a little bit too much, but um, I was, I was uh, rebuked this morning in a loving way that I did not uh, say, who, who are you? So hopefully that's a, a little bit about who we are. Uh, I'll ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 9. It's a very short verse tonight, so this won't be long, um, but we're going to do some interaction. I want, I want uh, you guys to feel free to, to raise your hand and comment. I'd like you to... Um, Feel free to ask questions because this is kind of a follow-up. I actually had another message prepared and, and uh, I really felt convicted that we just needed to stay with the same subject. It would be good just to walk away being able to think about this all week. So this morning we looked at a narrative or a, a parable really from Matthew. And, the, and this evening I want to look at a principle, a, a proverb if you would, and on the same idea just in a little different way. Um, it's interesting because as you, as you look at Proverbs, we, we, I think we all understand that Proverbs is well known to be the book of education, specifically education of wisdom, right? And 
I actually argue it's not just wisdom, it's paying attention to wisdom. It's valuing wisdom above all else. In fact, that's the first uh, several chapters, even through chapter 8, the father is telling his son, you need to value wisdom above silver and gold. You need to pursue her, treasure her, and she will exalt you. He goes on in in chapter 8 to compare her to a beautiful virgin bride and saying, "Why, why aren't you taking this bride? And as parents, essentially what we're doing is just passing on our treasures to our children. And obviously they they have a say in it, and the Holy Spirit has a say in it. Proverbs 2 actually goes through that, and that the Lord gives wisdom in in verse 5 and 6 there. By Him comes understanding. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 2, we understand that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. So we're not not excluding Him from that that equation. But in this, this context of educating our children is a very profound, very short but very profound verse on forgiveness. And so that's what I want to look at. This is so important that we teach our children forgiveness, and and constantly. Um, This is the theme that we chose, my wife and I chose for our children this year. We've been memorizing Ephesians 4.32, um, and and that's why I chose to to preach on this, because it has been been coming up uh, for our church in Greenville. I I head up the Good News Club. Do you, you guys have Good News Club down here? It's a child evangelistic fellowship. It's an incredible ministry. What it is is there are hundreds. Of, we get to go into the public school system, and for an hour every Tuesday, we get to preach the gospel to them. And hundreds of kids come. I mean, hundreds of kids. There were uh, over 2,000 professions of faith by these children um, in the last, uh, just in the last year. And so it's an incredible opportunity for us to share the gospel. And... Um, my, my, I, I was uh, supervising. I wasn't supposed to be uh, uh, giving the lessons because of the, the intensity of, of supervising. And the, the lady who was supposed to be doing the lesson said, I can't do it this week. Can you do it? It was Matthew 18. So, um, you know, God continues this theme through our lives. Uh, even though we chose it, he had a plan for us. And it's been exciting to see. Um, so I want to share this with you uh, this evening. All right, so uh, I'm going to be reading from the ESV. If you're, if you're reading from the King James, it's going to be a, a completely different, uh, you're going to walk away with a different meaning, okay? Uh, you recognize this. Let me read it from the ESV, and then we'll talk about the, the KJV there. The ESV says, Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. So it's a very short verse. Um, in the KJV, it says, Fools mock at sin. And you've probably heard messages on that. If you actually go through the usages of this word, the majority of uses refer to the guilt offering that Israel would have to offer for their sins. And it's specifically talking about the offering, ultimately the ultimate atonement, right? The greatest guilt offering, which was Jesus Christ. Again, this is Proverbs 14, verse 9. Fools mock at the guilt offering. And this is interesting because uh, in, in reading for this book I'm writing now and, and a lot of the research, I've been reading, uh, I mean, literally uh, dozens if not hundreds of books uh, from secular viewpoints, and there's an overwhelming theme that continues to pop up that seculars now are admitting they say is the cause of mental illness. Now, their idea and their theory is completely foreign of, of Scripture. You understand that. But they're now realizing that guilt is a major issue that has to be dealt with. Surprise, surprise, right? In fact, uh, UC Berkeley just came out with a study this past May, so actually a year ago, May, um, that they say that guilt actually causes the brain to shrink. So they have done study after study, and from that, numerous studies have been done that they're now saying uh, depression and anxiety are caused by guilt. It's a major issue that we all have to, guilt, to, to deal with. And an interesting thing about guilt, I don't want you to think of guilt as just an idea or an emotion. Guilt is actually a reality based on something that happens. So it's, it is a thought, it is an emotion, but it's based on something that is true, something that really happened. And what, what's, what's um, uh, guilt isn't always something that you have done. Sometimes it's something that you haven't done or something that 
uh, is even deception that comes from our hearts. So you feel guilty about something that you, you shouldn't even because our hearts are deceitful, as Jeremiah 17, 9 says. But it is a true thought. In other words, it is, it is a thought process. Guilt is, is something that is born out of a reality, if you would. So it's not just um, a feeling. And don't think of it that way. We have a major need to accept this guilt offering. But what do fools do? They mock at the guilt offering. Uh, let me first read some of, of um, what I've, I've been studying here. Uh, Peter Martin, quoted by psychologist uh, Dr. Dave Grossman, I was talking with, with some of our uh, former soldiers, and, and, and you know, I, I personally appreciate it. I know we all do your service for our country, and I didn't say that in our conversation, but um, I, I got the opportunity to interview two uh, Army Rangers, and their sole job is to go on missions and kill people. That's what they do. I mean, they, they go and kill, and they've killed numerous times. And these are two unsaved young men, and I was talking with them, and they were very, I mean, standoffish. They, they didn't want to talk uh, to people. And as soon as I started talking to them about what they do, I mean, they just got excited. And literally, I mean, they, they started, I mean, physically getting excited and started telling me about it. And I said, do you struggle with guilt? And both of them immediately said, nope. And I said, why is that? And they said, read the book on killing. So what did I do? <laughs> I read the book on killing. And it's written by Dr. Grossman, who was the uh, former, he's now retired, psychologist at West Point. And listen to what he, he quotes uh, Peter Marin in, in one of his uh, chapters. And Peter Marin is a, a psychiatrist. And he says, as a society, we seem unable to deal with moral pain or guilt. Instead, it is treated as a neurosis or as a pathology, something to escape rather than something to learn from, a disease rather than as it may be well for the vets, an appropriate if not painful response to the past. So what he's saying is God has allowed us to, to understand guilt for a reason, but we want to treat it as a sickness, right? As, a, as, as he says, pathology or psychosis, neurosis. And instead of realizing that guilt has a purpose, and the only way to deal with it correctly is to receive the guilt offering. Uh, similarly, another uh, psychiatrist, uh, Margarita uh, Tartakovsky, and she actually was involved in the, the um, UC Berkeley experiments. She says, if you also have depression, you too probably have a list. You too probably can relate to the gnawing, stubborn, and heavy weight of guilt. It is guilt that can lead to self-doubt or even self-harm. Guilt sparks insecurity, indecision, and even poor decisions. This is a secularist, okay? Does, doesn't have an idea of how the gospel should affect her life. But she recognizes that guilt is a major problem in her life. And again, guilt is not the enemy. Guilt is there for a reason. It's leading us to the guilt offering, which is Jesus Christ. But what do fools do? They mock at guilt. So let me read just two illustrations quickly. And then I'll get some feedback from you guys, um, and we can start asking some questions, and then I'll go to the, the next point here. Uh, Richard Dawkins, how many of you heard of Richard Dawkins? The, the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, godless person, right? He says, an especially warped and disgusting application of the flawed concept of, of retribution is the Christian crucifixion as atonement for sin. So he is what we call a determinist. In other words, he believes that we're all products of our circumstances. He holds that instead of us being culpable or responsible for our, our actions, that we're just like a car. In fact, he actually says that in this, this same article. He actually says that, that we don't hold a car responsible for killing someone. Why are we holding people responsible? And this is the whole philosophy behind this, this whole movement. And he's saying that the atonement of Jesus Christ is, is, an, is a, a perfect example of this, and he says a disgusting application. So he looks at us, and he goes on to say actually as mentally ill because of our, our view. Or let me, let me read another one to you, and this one is um, uh, Sam Harris. How many of you have heard of Dr. Sam Harris? He's a neuroscientist. He's written a book called The End of Faith. And he's an atheist, and he actually uh, proposes, and this is, this is kind of, I'll, I'll 
another sidetrack, but uh, it's, it's, it's uh, my wife's going to get me after the service, but um, he writes this book to show how faith is responsible for all the evil in the world, okay? But keep in mind that he blames everything on the brain. He's a determinist as well. So he says the brain is responsible for all that we do, all that we feel, all that we think. But he writes a book to say that, and, and I'm, I'm almost quoting verbatim here, he says that faith is responsible for our behaviors, our mindsets, emotions, and desires in the book. And it has to be eliminated. So he actually undermines his whole brain theory by writing this book to try to undermine faith. Obviously, faith apart from Christ is detrimental, it's destructive. But faith in Christ is, is freedom and what we need. So he goes on to say, uh, Sam Harris, humanity has a long fascination with blood sacrifice. In fact, it has been by no means uncommon, uh, skip, uh, uncommon for a child to be born into this world only to be patiently and lovingly reared by religious maniacs who believe that the best way to keep the sun on its course or to ensure a rich harvest is to lead him by tender hand into a field or to a mountaintop and bury, butcher, or burn him alive as an offering to the invisible God. The notion that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that his death constitutes a successful propitiation of loving God is a direct and un undisguised inheritance of the superstitious bloodletting that has plagued bewildered people throughout history. And that's taken um, actually from another one of his books, uh, Letters to a Christian Nation, published by Random House. Uh, these are bestsellers. People are reading these. And um, this is what a fool does. He looks at the guilt offering and says, don't need it. But that is contrasted. And before we go to the second point, I want to open it up to comments uh, or questions that you guys have uh, that would be, be good discussion for us. Anybody want to ask, comment, or you want me to keep going? Yes, sir. Thank you for sharing that. I, I can tell, sim, tell you similar stories of, of people who were labeled as schizophrenic. In fact, um, I, I'm thinking of one, one episode I was called, and uh, they, they told us that she was demon-possessed. And so I, at that time, I was on pastoral stuff. I called the head pastor, and he's like, uh, you deal with it. But he went with me. And same thing, um, she just... You know, if you know anything about what they call schizophrenia, it's just the pure deception of the heart. Something horrible has happened, and they don't want to deal with that. And so they live in deception. They, they live in a fantasy world. And um, instead of dealing with those issues, and by God's grace, she, she uh, after finally just saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to play those games. We're here to help. So tell us the truth. What can we help you with? And 
She just opened the floodgates, and, and uh, by the time it was done, she had received Christ as her Savior. Doing, still in the church, doing well. So, you know, there, there is freedom from guilt if we, if we pursue that guilt offering. Thanks for sharing that. Anything else? Questions? Yes. How much time do we have? <laughs> That's, that's a really good question. Let, let me answer that with um, uh, going back in history because I think that, that will help you understand. Most people know who Sigmund Freud is. Sigmund Freud is, is kind of interesting. You know, the devil has schemes that he sets up, and we, we tend to focus our attention on Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was a determinist as well, by the way, but the real person, the, the modern-day uh, model or construct of mental illness is actually based on a guy named Emil Kreplin. Emil Kreplin was actually born the same day as Sigmund Freud, and they didn't like each other. Emil Kreplin proposed, he was the first, he's called the father of, of modern day psychiatry, pharmacology, and the whole genetic theory. And this was back in the 1880s. So Emil proposed that the, the brain was responsible for what we call today mental illness. And the two illnesses of that time were schizophrenia and what we call now bipolar disorder. So going from happy, by the way, in chapter 14 and verse 13, the Bible tells us what, what that actually is, interestingly enough. Um, it talks about the end of, of mirth is sadness. So it, it, we're in the same chapter there. Um, and, and again, the Bible has the answers to these things. That's not an abnormality for someone to go full on and try to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and then reality to hit and be depressed is, is normal. But the world says that's abnormal. Anyway, so at that time, psychiatry was just for what they called, and this isn't my words, idiots. So you had psych wards. Now, psychiatry is all out in the public, right? It, it is, I mean, anything that ails you, there is a drug for it. If you're too happy, there's a drug. If you're too sad, there's a drug. If you're too hyper, there's a drug. If you're too mellow, there's a drug. If you're too fat, there's a drug. There, you know, on it goes. Every human experience, and essentially, uh, if you think about it, secularism has to deal with issues, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. So how do you get joy without the Holy Spirit? Well, you can, you can uh, get high like a lot of people do to escape society. Now, I'm off track here. Let me get back to this. So in Emil Kreplin first proposed that uh, it was a brain issue and genetics were involved and thus began the whole eugenics movement in Germany. Now, if you, if you um, read a lot of history books, they won't talk about psychiatry being responsible for the Holocaust, but it really is. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep going here. Um, Emil Kreplin actually proposed that the, the most mentally ill of all people were the Jews. That, that was his theory. And you can read, you can actually go to Wikipedia and read this stuff. But most people have never heard of Emil Kreplin when, when I talk about him. And that is because they have, uh, if you read Secularist, uh, a book just came out two weeks ago. Um, I, I couldn't put it down. I read it in a day. It's actually by Jeffrey Lieberman, who is the former American Psychiatric Association president. And he is praising psychiatry where they're at now. But he, the, the three-fourths of the book is how horrible and barbaric psychiatry has been throughout the ages. And the last part, he says, we have returned now and abandoned Freudian thinking, and now we're, we're relying on Emil Kreplin. So he says the same thing. And it, it's, it's, there's a reason why you haven't heard of Emil Kreplin, because it's his theories that are being instituted today. There still is no proof. I'll give you an example. Chemical imbalance. How many of you have heard of chemical imbalance? Do you realize that, that you cannot measure the chemicals in one person's brain? I, I just uh, spoke with neurosurgeon Dr. Hugh Clark, and he was saying that the brain is so complex, as we change our thinking, our brain levels fluctuate. You can't measure a normal level. There, it doesn't exist. So how can you say there's an imbalance? Uh, Dr. Peter Bregan, who wrote a book called Toxic Psychiatry, he's a secularist. He actually says that we are the ones creating chemical imbalance by giving chemicals to try to treat these real life issues. And so uh, what I'm saying is, um, I, and I'm, I'm going somewhere, so I, kn I know it, uh, we have returned to Emil Kreplin's thinking. 
Now you've got people like Sam Harris saying the most mentally ill of all people are Christians. You've got people like Bill Maher, who's a liberal talk show host, saying Christians need to be, need to be put in psych wards because we are delusional, we talk, we're paranoid, we believe in the devil, we are schizophrenic, we talk to magical, invisible people, we uh, are obsessive compulsive, we have to come to church, and if we don't, we feel guilty, and guilt, guilt's the problem, isn't it? I mean, th these are things they're saying constantly. This is reality, and I, I actually believe that persecution will come through, again, through psychiatry, because th these things are out there. Um, now, now, to be more specific, the, the interesting thing is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we'll call it the DSM, it's easier to, to say, was invented by Emil Kreplin. And he's the first one to do that. So throughout the ages, that system has, has actually returned to his system. Within that, see, and this is how deceptive this thing is. Autism is a real physical problem. It's not a, a mental problem, but they call it mental illness. Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, these are real problems of either sensory issues or brain but they've lumped it into to mental illness, if you would. So let me, let me back up just a second and, and tell you the whole thinking of that time. So in Germany, uh, the whole materialism was a big thing, taking what was spiritual and making it material. Scient the Scientology does this as well. Okay, so you've got, you've got the idea of... of um, that which is spiritual and moral, and they literally try to say it's physical. So if you read secular literature, they'll say your mind is actually just part of your brain. It's a physical, evolved, and of course, Kreplin was Darwinian. So what they're doing is what's called materialism, but materialism never stops with, with that. It ends with determinism, that no one is responsible for anything. We can do whatever we want because we're just products of our past. And that's the part they don't want to tell you. So in, in 1960, homosexuality was taken out of the DSM-3 very, very cunningly. And we won't go into that. But um, keep in mind, these people were, were, they were uh, sterilized. They were drugged. This was a diagnosis. It wasn't a guess. These people were called mentally ill. And then all of a sudden, oh, you're not mentally ill anymore. I mean, imagine the, imagine the, the frustration because that's the power. Whoever, whoever can define what is abnormal has the authority. And really, you can't talk about what is abnormal unless you decide what is normal, which obviously we rely on Scripture to do that. So there are valid physical issues like autism, dementia. Um, in, in his book uh, on killing, Dr. Grossman actually talks about soldiers in war who don't get sleep. And he says, you would think what we call mental illness I mean, they, they're delusional, they can't recognize people, they, they start getting angry, they start crying uncontrollably because of lack of sleep. And that's understandable. And there's a lot of people that aren't getting sleep that are labeled mentally ill. And, you know, there are genuine physical issues. But it is actually, uh, Thomas Saws, who I mentioned to you, he has a whole, whole good, what did I say? <laughs> he, has a, he has a whole book on... Um, on how is it impossible to call that which is mental an illness because illness is physical. It's really interesting. Now, Scripture actually talks about illness metaphorically, and that's actually what happened. They, Freud actually says in several of his books, we're going to take what the church owns, the care for souls, and we're going to take it. And that's, that is what has happened as far as the spiritual nature. So... Uh, that which is spiritual is still owned by God, but the world says, we have to deal with this. How do we do it? It's by, by creating these, these diseases and then, and then uh, going after them. So I don't have time to go into everything, but hopefully that'll... that'll uh... Yes, ma'am. Yes, in fact, he, he is saying it is the most destructive... No one can live without faith. I agree. That's right. We walk in the dark room. We just don't know. That's right. We drink water for filter. Yep. You know, um, in, in one of the books I read was uh, Dr. Karl Popper. Anybody heard of Dr. Karl Popper? 
He's one of the most famous scientists. And for you teachers, this is a, a good book. Uh, Dr. Karl Popper uh, it was a, a philosopher of science. And he actually says science begins with myths and the refutation of myths. And, and he's exposing that it's a faith issue. Well, Hebrews 11 says that, doesn't it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then it says, by faith, in, the next, in, in verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by him. Faith precedes science. And that's what, actually what Popper was saying, is the whole idea of, of having a, a theory in science means that you're putting your faith in something. Now, that could be proven true or not. Problem is, their theory of mental illness has never been proven true. But they, as long as they're doing scientific experiments, they can keep saying that, oh, it's scientific, because we're experimenting on it. <laughs> you know, They've never tried to disprove God, because uh, one of the books I read, um, they actually say, we can't disprove God, <laughs> which is interesting uh, that they actually admit that. So, good question. Well, it, Christian psychology, and, and again, I don't want to judge the people because I th I've met some people that just absolutely love other people and they want to help. But if you really understand, God says in Corinthians that we have to cast down every stronghold and everything that opposes the gospel. And um, that's, that's part of the burden that I have for writing this book is because essentially if you understand what Emil Kreplin was doing and what they're doing now, they are saying throw God out and accept Darwinian view. I don't know if you know this, but Darwin was one of the most racist people alive. In fact, if you read the origin of species is actually because he says we're all different species and the strong surviving, that means the strongest race should survive. So Kreplin's taking that view is just practically working out what Darwin suggested. And, and what is scary to me is that um, if you, if you read, uh, uh, the, I mean, there's so many books out now that people are disclosing all these things. Uh, one of the books uh, called Our Daily Meds is written by uh, Peterson, who is a New York Times, not, not a godly, uh, not a godly uh, resource. She actually exposes that 270 people die every day from prescription drugs, specifically for mental illness. Uh, if you read the warning labels on depression medication, most uh, antidepressants, it says causes suicide. And Dr. Peter Bregan has pointed out that we're actually, uh, the Holocaust is repeating itself, but not under the, the ge same genetic principle. And now it's if you're defective, we'll willfully, I mean, you're willfully submitting yourself to this medication. And people are dying. And then the, the illness gets blamed. Oh, they had bipolar, and so they, they killed themselves. This is happening left and right. I mean, left and right. And so even though there could be very good intentions by these people, and I, I don't doubt, like James Dobson as an example, um, I, I don't question that he really cares about people, but he's, he's not informed. And here's, here's the awesome thing. I don't have time to go into this tonight, but maybe, maybe I should. But uh, 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Do you know what the secularists argue about? Nature and nurture. Life, and they don't call it godliness, they call it the brain, right? Because they don't even recognize that we're moral beings. And God has given us everything pertaining to life. So let's say you were abused as a child. And by the way, this is one of the things that in, in counseling that I find over and over and over again. Um, there are so many people so hurt emotionally and, and even physically from things that were done to them by people that should have been loving them and caring for them. And they carry that... And it, and it hurts their, their relationships now. And, you know, God has answers to those life issues. He has the answers. So if he really does, why are we looking outside of Scripture? That, and that's, that would be my number one answer. So my, my challenge to people is, is not, not in a, a cruel way. I hope you understand that. If God's Word doesn't have answers, let's look at what the secularists are saying. But I have not found a single thing they call mental illness that God doesn't have an answer for. Not a single thing. So... That's the, the incredible nature. He's sufficient. He really is sufficient. We just don't do our work, and, and we're trusting this Darwinian paradigm. I mean, it really is. By the way, they changed eugenics to genetics, and they still talk about genetics, genetic dysfunction. You'll, you'll, uh, I, I, was, I met with a guy um, two weeks ago. Uh, he has three brothers that are labeled as schizophrenic. His mom was labeled as schizophrenic. His mom was so abusive to them 
And I said, you don't, you don't see the pattern there that behaviors, behaviors are learned. You know, my, my children speak the same languages as us because they've learned that behavior from us. But it's convenient to say it's genetics because then, then oh, I'm not responsible for, for my children's uh, uh, actions. So we have to be careful because I, I think a lot of people say that all mental illness is a spiritual issue. Ultimately, it is. But if they've gone through abuse, they need to recognize the guilt offering in another way. In other words, what we talked about this morning, and that is I'm, I'm bearing, if I'm abused, I'm bearing the guilt of that person. The only way to relinquish that is to say, I forgive you and give that guilt. But now they just have to deal with God. Can you think of a good example of that, the perfect example? I, I, I'm not phrasing this well, but Christ on the cross, right? What did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, this is interesting because this is an important aspect of forgiveness. He, he did it this way, right? Does that mean the whole world's saved? Not at all, right? There must be a restoration this way too. So we do the same thing. The, the passage in Mark 5 that I read this morning on when you stand and pray, if you have ought, forgive, right? That's what it's saying. It's saying, God, I, I don't want this. And your heavenly father will. He'll forgive you. So it has to be this way and then this way. And that, that's the perfect example in Scripture is that Christ said, Father, forgive them. His heart was, he wasn't going to hold the guilt. He was giving it to God. And obviously, he didn't do anything wrong. We were the ones. He took our guilt on the cross, which is just an amazing picture. But for us to, uh, again, that guilt offering, we have to offer that back to the person that abused us or, or hurt us deeply and say, you know, I don't want this and I don't want you to have this type thing. That's the only way to deal with that. But instead, people, I mean, like a backpack, they bear that heavy burden and uh, carry it through their lives, unfortunately. Great example. Very good example. But let me ask you, how many of you would, would be honest? I mean, you don't have to go into details, but how many of you have been really deeply hurt in life? I'm raising my hand. I mean, really hurt. Majority of us in here, right? I mean, that, that, we tend to think that we're alone many times. That's another thing I find with people is no one has ever been hurt like me. And then, and then you know, when I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm hearing it and then I, I start counseling somebody else and I'm like, you went through that? That's, I mean, your heart just breaks for those people, what they have gone through. Um, just so sad. Life is, life is it's, it's, fallen. it's just as fallen as we are in um, there's a lot of hurting people. Yes, sir. Well, and, and, and that's the vertical, and that's a very good point. Can't be. There can't be. But, but that person isn't still alive. So, in other words... Um, Hatred, I guess, or bitterness is what you, you harbor when, when guilt from someone else is there. So if, the, if you can't, and I'm saying this metaphorically, if you can't give it back to them, we are told to give it to God. In other words, God, I don't, I don't want to hate this person. You know, they're, they're gone. I can't do anything else about it. But uh, forgive me for, you know, harboring this and holding on to it because it's not mine to hold on to and understanding that, that atonement. So there is that vertical and in the horizontal. And, and the same is true if, if you go to someone and they're unwilling to, to ask for forgiveness from you, right? You can still relinquish that and say, God, I, I, I have uh, allowed them to be guiltless in my mind, but they don't want it. So they still have a problem. Does that make sense? There's not been restitution. It's, it's the same with what, what Christ did on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. So I'm, I'm ready to forgive, but we still have to ask God to forgive us. It's not that everybody in the world is, is already forgiven. Does that, does that help? Good. All right, now I've, I've, uh, I'm just going to mention the second point, and then uh, if there's any more questions or comments, we can, we can go a little bit longer. But I've, I shouldn't have gone on a sidetrack, but <laughs> hopefully it will be a little helpful there. Uh, the second is that guilt prohibits intimate fellowship. So the second part of that verse... Um, it's, it's interesting because it says the upright enjoy acceptance. 
So guilt destroys relationships. And, and a lot of people, I was talking about the relationship with mother and father or spouses. And the, the amount of damage that is done from, from one bad relationship where there's guilt, whether that person has done bad or the, the, you yourself have, have uh, offended, guilt is very destructive. And it only comes through and it contrasts the fool. So fools mock at the guilt offering. The wise or the upright are ones that when they offend, oh man, I, I, I want guilt taken care of in my own life and others' lives. And that's what Proverbs 1.3 says, right? Justice is one of the things that wisdom brings. So if we, if we are truly in that guilt offering, if we have accepted the atonement of Christ, we're going to be people that are ready to forgive. And if we have offended, even if we don't think we have, we're going to want to restore that relationship. That's, that's grace. That's, that's grace. Uh, Steve and I were talking um, this afternoon. You know, many times... Uh, it's just miscommunication. We, we sincerely want to, to do something and someone takes it completely different than what we were saying. And that happens a lot, doesn't it, as people? And uh, it, just by going to them and, and not saying, again, not saying angrily and accusing them, but asking them, hey, what, what was said? And giving them the opportunity. And many times you'll find nothing that I was said. In fact, this, this just happened to me a month ago. Um, uh, Someone came to me and said, hey, there were things said about you. And I went, what? So instead of going and bad-mouthing this person, I said, let's follow you know, the gospel. And I went to her and I said, instead of saying this was said about, that you said about me, I just said, um, it was brought to my attention that there, there might be some issues. And, and I, I want to hear from you, you know, what can I work on? Or, and she's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it had gotten uh, through four different people, had turned into this monster. And uh, we had a, a sweet time, and, and uh, it was just neat to see. And she, she, before I left, she said, thank you so much for, for doing things biblically. She said, I, this is the value of just doing things right. Now, if I had gone in there, which I'm confessing here, my flesh was saying, why would she do that? You know, if I got in there and said, why would you do that to me? Then it could have been a whole different outcome. And instead, God, God was gracious. And again, I say it was God because my flesh was saying, go in there and, and you know, but uh, by God's grace, it didn't happen that way. So um, let me read one, one uh, um, Derek Kidner, one of the most well-known uh, commentators on Proverbs. He says, every fool mocks at guilt. With the second line, the whole proverb contrasts the uncertain of fools for the damage they do. Fools go do damage. They don't care. They don't care who is left in their path. You know, get over it. If I've offended you, too bad. And that's actually a sign of a foolish person, not a wise. He goes on to say, God word and man word. So a wise person is one who's very concerned when they've offended God and when they've offended others. They want justice. With the care of the upright is to preserve goodwill. And that's from his uh, book on uh, commentary on Proverbs. So a true believer will do what we can to, to make things right, if you would. Any questions or comments tonight? More? All right, we went over tonight. That was not my intention, but um, I thought it was going to be short. Dan, yes. We weren't at the okay, good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> um, why don't you pray for us in closing? Would you do that for us, please?